Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, th this talk, um, it started off really uh, when I was on 208 Squadron of Flying Buccaneers uh, at RAF Lossiemouth. Um, the, the way it really started was uh, I got a, an interview, a rather sp a speedy interview, uh, along with my pilot uh, to go and see the boss. Uh, and we went in to see the boss, and it was something alleged about overflying a Caledonian brain ferry at 100 feet, which we hadn't done, I might add, uh, but that didn't really matter. Uh, and we stood there looking at our shoes, receiving this uh, tirade of abuse from the boss and things like that. And as you do when you're getting something like that, it's just sort of standing there. I looked at the boss's uh, bookshelf, and there was this book about Naval 8 Squadron. Um, and I thought, you know, it took about another fortnight when the boss was again speaking to me and uh, having a cup of tea. And I sort of said, hey, can I borrow that book, please? And, and I read this book. And in the back, it, it mentioned that there were 29 people that had lost their lives on the squadron in, in this time. A little bit later, I, I was one of the more senior navigators on the squadron. I used to fly with the Air Office Commanding when he came up. Um, and he was an ex-member of 208 and had served with them in Egypt. And we got talking about history and various things like that. And he sort of said, well, if you want to go out to the battlefields, I'll authorise it, as long as you don't just mess about, go down, do some work, find some of the airfields, find the graves. Uh, and from 1988 through, I, I retired in 94, I still did a job uh, working uh, as a private company in NATO. And we used to go to Florenne in Belgium. And I used to coerce people if we were there over the weekend to go down to the battlefields, go and find things out. And eventually, uh, trips to the, um, the Imperial War Museum, trips to uh, the RAF Museum, Fleet Air Arm Museum, National Archives, eventually I managed to get just about everything I could. I did find out it was only 28 that were killed. One guy, remarkably called Living, survived. But he was repatriated, he was shot down right at the end of the war, he was repatriated direct to uh, Canada. And this is really where the story came and my interest. It's basically the talk about of a scout squadron in those days. Um, 208 Squadron or Naval 8 were actually drafted in because the RFC were having all sorts of difficulties. Uh, at the time, and they came in, and you'll get the full story of what exactly they, they, they were like. Um, the scope of the talk, really, we'll talk about the chronology, what actually happened with them. I'll talk about the aircraft and their performance, operations, the flying environment. Uh, basically, it's great to talk about all these things and just give facts and figures and things like that. It's basically the people that are interested in me. How would I have fitted in on that squadron? And what were the people like? That, that's the thing that really matters to me. What was it like flying in those days? Um, remarkably different to today. Um, we'll talk about the culture and the personalities. I'll have a little summary of the activities of the squadron, and then at the end we can have questions if you're not brain dead by then or fed up of listening to me. Um, so the formation of the squadron then. On the 26th of October 1916, the squadron formed at St. Paul near Dunkirk, led by a squadron commander, Bromet. Right up to the end, there was a Bromet trophy for the most effective operational person on the squadron. So he, he left a legacy. Um, he still kept going to the reunions right up until the mid-1980s. Uh, and he was a force. He, he was quite... And I, I believe there's a statue of him at the uh, airport in the Isle of Man, which is where he was from. Um, there was one flight each from one, four, and five wings of the RNAS. So you ended up with three different uh, uh, aircraft there. You had the Newport, which was led by Flight Lieutenant Commander McKenzie. I'll talk about him later. Um, flight Lieutenant Goebel, quite a notable person. He was Australian. He ended up as the Chief of the Air Staff in the Royal Australian Air Force and was responsible for a lot of formation of uh, what happened there. Again, you'll see that these people were quite incredible. Um, you know, they were very, very dynamic. So the aircraft themselves, we've got the Newport, uh, fairly modern for the times, single seat. I won't go greatly into that because it didn't survive on the squadron for very long. 
the Sopwith pup, which was basically the, the squadron took over eventually. The naming of the Sopwith pup, quite interestingly, I found out the, there was a chap called General Branker who was responsible for procurement and things like that. And he went to visit Sopwith's airfield, and in the hangar there, they had a Sopwith one and a half strutter and the little aeroplane alongside it. And he remarked when he went in, good grief, your one and a half strutters had a pup. And that is how Sopwith Pup got its name. And then there was the larger one and a half strutter. Two seat, generally flown single seat uh, on Naval 8. 11th of November, the pups replaced the strutters. 20th of December, the pups replaced Newport. So they were a full pup squadron. 1st of February, they handed over the pups to three naval. And Sea Flight formed the nucleus of nine naval. So at this stage, there were something like eight naval squadrons. They were just constantly reinforced as the RFC at this sort of stage. And then they went on from February to March. Um, they re-equipped with the Sopwith triplane. And here we've got a picture of the Sopwith triplane with Flight Commander McKenzie. Note he's got his aeroplane dusty there. Now, a little, a brief talk about McKenzie. He was a flight commander and he was responsible for all the tactics. Um, one thing with Flight Commander McKenzie is the RAF Museum have got a copy of his tactics manual that he produced for the squadron. As well as that, it is... A, 29 Squadron, the Typhoon, currently at RAF Coningsby, have a facsimile of that in their crew room as well, which explains air tactics. And in general terms, most of the things that he talks about are still valid today. So he was quite an advanced guy. I'll now talk about, uh, we've got the brilliantly named Flight Lieutenant Reggie Saw. Um, who is sat there in Hilda, and one of the pilots on the squadron, Crundle, uh, this is a quote from him. Saw and I went out in the evening. He told, nobody, told me nobody in sea flight liked the name Whitfield, which is what he'd named his aircraft after the village he lived in, and it was suggested I should change it. I was promised a brand new machine if I would select a name in accordance with the others on the flight. All the machines have girls' names. I told Saw... I don't know many girls. Saw had his name Hilda, and there was Gwen and Brenda. It was suggested mine should be called Doris. So the name Whitfield is being painted off N5439. And then he remarks, 21st of March, 1917. I flew Doris, which I liked very much. So they re-equipped with the Sopwith Camel um, a little bit later in July. And there's the Sopwith Camel. The big difference, really, between the uh, triplane and the Camel, two guns. It's named because of a little hump on the front as well. Two flights became operational by mid-July, and they're fully equipped in September 1917. On the 8th of November, nine, sorry, uh, they upgraded their engines from 130 to 150 horsepower. Think about if you've got a Golf TDI, that's about 150 brake horsepower. So it gives you an idea of the technology in those days. And on the 8th of November, a little bit early, three days to go, uh, they re-equipped with the Sopwith Snipe, and they obviously didn't do very much with them at that stage. And here's a picture of the Sopwith Snipe. Much bigger aeroplane. Uh, so now I'll just talk a little about aircraft performance. OK, if you look at the aircraft performance here, generally, speeds of about 110 to 120 miles an hour. Our aircraft tended to have an endurance of about two and a half, three hours. The reason being that we were flying offensive patrols. So we were patrolling and we didn't pick when to fight. The Germans generally got airborne, chose when they were going to go and do a fight, and so they could have aircraft with much uh, smaller endurance, much lower endurance. The heights generally, if you consider about 20,000 feet, and the weight of the aircraft was critical depending on the power that they had as well. If we look at the, uh, the engines, going up to 200 horsepower at the end, as I've said, not that different to a, a modern car, but it was absolute prime technology in those days. 
big difference between the, the, the Allies and the Germans. The Germans worked around an aircraft being a, a weapons machine. So they always had two guns. They designed it around the guns. We gradually worked up to getting two guns. And that was the main difference, really, there with uh, the, the, the camel and the snipe. They could put much more firepower in. So the adversaries then, if we just go to the, um, the Albatross and the Fokker triplane, as I've said before, the aircraft weren't really designed for endurance. They had a specific task. They chose when they were going to go into a fight. Um, the Albatross was aluminium uh, and had a skin uh, much, much heavier. The other thing about the Germans was eventually they were the first people to have heating in the aeroplane to have a more robust system, parachutes as well. We didn't have parachutes at all in the First World War. Um, and uh, in later aircraft, the reconnaissance aircraft, the Germans put oxygen in uh, uh, as well. Basically, I'm sure you, most of you know, the Allies didn't like the idea of putting parachutes in because they thought the pilots would be less aggressive. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the aircraft and there's the a comparison, really. Very similar sort of heights and speeds. The endurance is slightly different, but the Germans always ended up with two good big guns, and things were built around that. I'll now just go on to the ground crew. Um, they followed a proud Navy tradition. Uh, there were six aircraft per flight, and on each flight, uh, a rigger and a fitter was allocated to them. That was their aeroplane. The, the fitter did just about everything to do with the instruments um, uh, and the, the main bit around the cockpit. The rigger did all of the aircraft surfaces, the cables and that sort of thing as well. But they were very, very loyal to their aeroplane and their pilot wherever they went with this. Um, Quite often, they'd have to strip the engine down overnight and rebuild it. They did an awful lot of work. The squadron had its own workshops, so they could do deeper servicing. But in a lot of cases, for instance, the skin of the, on the wings and things could be replaced every two or three weeks. So it, wasn't, it was a constant method that they were having to do things with. If an aircraft was crashed, had crashed, it was salvaged by the crews uh, as well. So the ground crews did that. And Flight Commander Comston states, in Naval 8, we had the finest lot of men the RNS could produce. Drawn from every branch and trade, they all worked unsparingly to keep our machines in good condition. The conditions under which they sometimes had to work were deplorable. Imagine nine inches of snow on the ground, with an icy wind blowing through many holes in the canvas Bessano hangar, the feel of cold spanners and frozen oil, making of delicate adjustments with hands numbed to the bone. So although they had it easier than the infantry, they were still working incredibly hard. Um, loyalty mentions. After landing, I stated that my engine felt a bit rough. The next morning, the engine had been completely dismantled and built up during the night. Nothing much had been amiss, but the rough, roughness had certainly disappeared. Draper, a squadron commander, talks about the ground crew and their accommodation. There were no union hours for them. They had to be ready to turn out day and night when duty called. During the German offensive, ratings were conveyed to a relief aerodrome next to an ammunition dump and working hard all day were brought back to camp. Surrounded by mud, two tiers of bunks down each side and one in the middle, at the end of the canvas window and the beloved Canadian stove. Twenty odd men, twenty odd kit bags, primus stoves, and petrol tins fashioned into washing basins, stewing pans, and many of the necessities related to everyday life. The pervading stench of congestion associated with the ablutions and cooking of meals. So it gives you an idea of the conditions they were, were in. I'll now go and talk about the airfields that they operated from. Vert Galand was the, uh, once they'd formed at St. Paul, they moved down to Vert Galand, which even today you can tell exactly where it is. It's on the Doulon Amiens Road. Uh, it's on a crossroads. There were four squadrons there. And one squadron would be on each side, if you like, of the airfield there. Um, as I say, it is very, very easy to see where they were uh, at that sort of stage. 
And we've got a photograph there of the Naval 8 part of uh, Vertkaland. The one thing is that all four of those squadrons operated completely independently of each other. They reformed in St. Paul um, with the triplane and proceeded to the next place, our shell. Some people uh, refer to our shell as Losingham, uh, which 25 squadron were, were situated in the same place. They always referred to it as Losingham. <coughs> but it is the same place. It's in the middle of a built-up area, and today the, uh, there's no real sign of it, apart from the spoil tips that you see in photographs were, are actually still there today. The, uh, they were moved there in uh, March 17, ready for the Canadian offensive at Vimy Ridge. They then, once the uh, Canadian offensive was uh, successful, they moved closer to the front line at Mont saint uh, That was within 10 kilometers of the front line. They did occasionally get shelled there. Um, today, it is very, very similar to where it was, and it's had a ruined abbey, uh, which has got some towers in, and there's one quite famous picture of uh, the squadron commander Draper flying sideways through it. Um, which is just about the sort of thing he would do. I've got a picture here of the airfield. Now, most people will think of an airfield as very grassy and, um, you know, green and you know, a few trees around, things like that. That picture really explains that, I mean, it was a rocky surface that they were on. It's, it's not a very comfortable place. The, um, the grass was actually kept down by sheep at Mont saint as well. And I'm not sure about other airfields, but they did actually have a pen of sheep which they let out at night um, and they do, do their fill and then get, get rid of them for the next day once they started to fly. Um, the 1st of uh, March, they got sent to Dover for a rest. Uh, and then, of course, um, on the uh, 2nd of April, thanks to the Kaiser's offensive, they got regrouped and sent down to Lagorg airfield. 2nd of April, of course, they had then become an RAF unit. And so they were the newly formed 208 squadron. So all naval squadrons took a 200 in front of their name. Um, they were very, very close to the German front. Uh, they were defended by Portuguese troops who weren't necessarily totally committed to the cause. And when it came to the uh, 10th of April, 1918, the, the airfield, basically the Portuguese were running back and the airfield was about to be overrun by the Germans. It was a very foggy night and the squadron got together and Squadron Commander Draper, who was in charge at this stage, made the decision that they would evacuate by transport, by car, and he set fire to all the aircraft. Um, that one of the flight commanders was desperate to fly out. They ended up with this discussion and then Draper made this de decision. Not surprisingly, that didn't go down particularly well with the higher command. And from then on, Naval A, rather than being an elite unit, was sort of a little bit of has also runs. And Draper certainly didn't have the confidence of his commanders. Within three days, they'd actually got a full squadron complement again, and they were at Cerny Airfield. At this stage, they were doing mainly ground attack missions against the German offensive, so strafing and bombing. Just before the Battle of Amiens, they moved to Tramicor, which is slightly closer, so they could be involved in the, uh, in the Amiens offensive. And then after that, they basically followed the army along um, through different airfields as they moved. They started 29th of September, they moved to Fukakor, which was right in the middle of the, uh, the, the area that the Germans had uh, burnt completely clear, scorched earth, when they withdrew to the Hindenburg line. So they were under canvas in a, a, a terrible desert type area. 9th of October, they moved to Estray, which was, had previously been a German bomber unit. So they were in comfort and it was really quite nice. And then on the 26th of October, they moved under canvas again to Maretz to just follow that line. 
I'll now go into the operations that they flew. Basically, November, to, uh, November 16 to February 17, they were doing scout operations, fighter operations, close to the lines, denying the Germans reconnaissance and artillery spotting. From March onwards, it was in support of the Canadian offensive. And to do that, they went one stage further where they were flying over the German side and they were attacking airfields and basically challenging the Germans to come up and fight. From July through to February, they almost got a free roll to, to do what they wanted. The, the command was very happy with the fact that they would fly their patrols, uh, they would fly over German airspace, they would fly uh, on, on our side as well. And effectively, the, the flights were given more or less free reign to, to go and find something and get into a fight and, and do whatever you can. In March 18, they were obviously sent to rest. After that, it was stemming the German ground offensive, mainly strafing and bombing. And then all arms offensive right up to the end of the war. Very, very, although it says scout missions right at the end there, um, they didn't do very much in the way of scout operations because the SOP with Camel by that stage wasn't really as good as a fighter as the SE-5. Go on to the, um, the flying environment. One thing you've got to remember, if I don't know if anybody's ever flown in an open cockpit or anything like that, I, for the first time, flew in a, a, a Tiger Moth not so long back. And I was intrigued by it. It was brilliant. Loved it. But it's a totally different environment to what you would do nowadays in a normal aeroplane. Um, one thing you've got to consider is the temperature. Even on a summer's day at 17,000 feet, it's about minus 10 degrees. Okay? In the winter, it's about minus 35. They didn't have equipment like we've got nowadays. They didn't have the protection. Um, and to be perfectly honest, medically, people didn't know much about what was going on either. And, and so just try and put yourself in a position where you're going to be flying at minus 10 in an open cockpit for an hour and a half to two hours. Um, and it's, it's not a really great prospect, I would say. The flying clothing that they had uh, wasn't brilliant. You can see on the left-hand side there, we've got Flight Lieutenant Shaw in his uh, mother-in-law's fur coat. Um, and uh, people would buy and get whatever they could for themselves to make them as comfortable as they could. In the middle here, we have uh, a guy called Frederick Cotton who developed what's called the Sidcut suit, a one-piece suit that's very warm. And that was still worn in World War II. He was a squadron pilot. Uh, he developed this thing, and he was obviously quite a character because in 1917, he resigned his commission after an argument with the, uh, the higher-ups. His view was that people shouldn't be buying their own flying equipment from Fortnum and Masons and doing this sort of thing. It should be issued. And he basically resigned. Now, I can't think of a case. He, he must have been very well connected because you can imagine the derision that he would have suffered for leaving a squadron you know, lack of moral fibre and all that sort of thing. Um, but sure enough, he was determined enough with that. And in the top right there, we've got a squadron, com uh, squadron flight commander there in his uh, rather fetching lamb's wool trousers. Um, more about him a little bit later. That's flight commander Compston. Um, while I just carry on uh, about this Frederick Cotton, in the Second World War, he got an MBE. He was a friend of Ian Fleming, and he was also uh, very, very influential in the development of photography in the Second World War, along with another friend of his, Eastman. Um, and he was well known uh, by Churchill. So it, this guy didn't go away. He just kept going and going and, um, you know, and uh, had, had quite an influence. I'll now talk about Flight Commander Compston talks about the flying commission uh, conditions. We were muffled up to the eyes and wore fleece-lined thigh boots drawn up over a fleece or fur-lined Sidcot suit. A fur-lined helmet, complete with a chin guard and goggles, with a strip of fur all around them. Any parts of bare skin left open to the air were well coated with whale oil to prevent frostbite. 
For our hands, we found that an ordinary pair of thin silk gloves, if put on warm, then covered with ordinary leather gauntlets, retained enough heat for the patrol. If one started cold, it was impossible ever to generate sufficient heat from the body. I remember once having to come down from 300 feet only, so frozen I just had enough power to land the machine. I was incapable of pressing the triggers and had to be helped out of the machine and carried away. And I can draw your attention as well. There's a very good YouTube clip of von Richthofen getting dressed for battle. I don't know if anybody's seen this, but it's fascinating. The number of layers he, he puts on and the amount of time it takes. And he sort of waddles off eventually. Okay, on, carrying on with the flying environment then. Oxygen. If you consider that today, if you fly in an airliner, it will generally be set, when you're up in the 30,000 feet, at about 3,000 feet or so. If it goes above 8,000 feet, um, you generally get a, a pressure warning and the aircraft will go down. These people were flying at 18,000 feet. Today, the RAF, um, the regulators that they have, put you on 100% oxygen by the time you get to 18,000 feet. So these people were flying for two hours at that sort of height with that oxygen deficiency. The first thing that goes, and I know this, we, you know, in the RAF you used to do the hypoxia drills and things like that. <coughs> the first thing that happens is things start to go black and white. And it also comes in, you start to get tunnel vision. And there's lots and lots of cases where people were flying and they had no idea what was going on around their formation until they heard the gunfire, whether they were attacking or whether they were being attacked. Quite a lot of the time. And especially the inexperienced wingman just had no idea. There was one um, instance where Compton mentioned his wingman only knew they'd been attacked after he landed. Um, one thing with the hypoxia and the lung problems that developed afterwards as well, there, there was a guy with a DSC on Naval 8 called Galbraith. He'd got 12 kills and he was withdrawn from the squadron because he'd got such lung problems that he couldn't fly above 6,000 feet. This is a guy with a DSC. He was diagnosed with neurasthenia, neurasthenia which was the other talk for shell shock as well. So some of the pilots were actually put into the same position as someone who'd had um, some sort of shell shock or uh, difficulties. So, it, you know, there, there was a very, very poor understanding by the medical side of what was happening to these guys when they were flying. Visibility. If you think about flying in one of those aeroplanes, trying to see around most of them had castor oil, which was usually sprayed all around them. You've got whale oil smeared on your face. You've been woken up at half past four by the Batman to go off and go and do this, uh, the, this trip. You probably haven't shaved, I would imagine, because if you've broken the skin, it would be even worse when you're high. And that is the sort of environment that these people were going into day in, day out. Noise, another one. Very, very noisy in these cockpits. You couldn't make yourself heard, so they had to communicate in different ways. So the communication, no radios. Most flight commanders had streamers on their wings, so they'd have different colours. And there's a case where one of the flight commanders, Little, said, I met up with Captain Bishop, who'd obviously, he knew it was Captain Bishop, by the streamers on his wings. Um, and they went off and had a go at a couple of Germans themselves. They would use hand signals quite a lot of the time. Still used today, that sort of thing means I'm running out of fuel. Uh, can we land fairly soon? Um, they, that could mean we're going to land. It could also mean there's the enemy below. They used to point wherever they, they, they'd see something uh, as well. And there are also other things, that they, other things that are still used nowadays with the number of fingers to indicate how much longer they've got left before they, they need to go down. In general cases though, the flight commander made most of those decisions. Um, they used to use flares, uh, particularly if they're a red flare, 
you wouldn't be too upset about giving your position away if you're already being attacked. So quite often they fly a red very flare to see if some other scouts would come and help them uh, in with their fight. Maneuvering, communicating by maneuvering. It, if you're flying in a formation of six aircraft, which is what they did a lot of the time, then on one side, if somebody turns straight into you, it's going to make it very difficult. You could stall them and then spin the aircraft. So what they would do is waggle the wings, do a little bit of a manoeuvre to the way that they're going to turn, give the guys chance to drop back or move out of the way, and then turn. The people on that side would have been accelerating a little bit and getting a little bit closer because they've got to go round the outside of everything uh, as well. So communications weren't easy at all. The Germans used the colour of their aircraft, uh, you know, the Red Baron. Um, a lot of the time the leaders had very distinctly painted aircraft. Uh, we'll come on to that a little bit later as well. One other thing you've got to think about is gun operation. If you had a Lewis gun, you had 40, initially, you had 47 rounds in your canister. That's not really that many. So you've got to change the canister. If you look at the SE5, you had to pull the thing down on a, a, a like a, a chain. You'd then load the canister and then put it back up. You're flying at 100 miles an hour and you've got to fit this canister onto this thing. You know, it's not very simple at all. Um, at first, with the Vickers guns, they used to have canvas belts um, for the aircraft, for the Vickers. And they had to change that to metal links because the canvas was freezing up and jamming the gun. If you had a gun stoppage, what did you do? Uh, particularly if you had a stoppage as you were entering a fight. And that's the only time you'd know, really. Um, there's one case here where one of the flight commanders landed on our side, sorted the gun jam up, and then went back up. So it, it just gives you an idea of the, the, the sort of thing that was going on. Um, the combat operations. Tactics continually developing. I would say it's a bit like two blind people trying to cross the M25. You know, they could be highly intelligent, they do whatever, but they don't really have control of everything all around them. And it was really, really hazardous. As I've said, Flight Commander McKenzie developed these tactics and they're still used today. The basic principles, high up, you've got energy, you're likely to win if you stay high. If you've got speed, you can get out. If you've got an aircraft that turns really tight, use that to get out of the way. If you're flying in a formation, make sure you know what your leader's gonna do. So be well briefed on it. Um, the one thing that you've got to remember with this is squadrons had individual types, so they worked autonomously. So an SE5 squadron next to a Camel squadron didn't want to use the same tactics. So they would develop the squadron in their own area, in their own mess. Um, there was very little in the way of cross-fertilisation. Some people had friends on other squadrons and they might talk about what they were doing. Um, if they had the same aircraft, a, a good idea might come through on it. But generally, in, in most terms, it rested on the flight commander. If you had a good flight commander, you did quite well. Comston, for instance, lost no wingmen at all in his over a year on the squadron and he got 20 odd kills. So he wasn't a, a pacifist, he didn't get out of the way of fights, he, but he never actually lost anyone, which is remarkable, I think. In the mess, the pilots would talk about tactics. They, they, over, they were in little close-knit groups. Um, a lot depended on your wingmen. You, you've heard of this guy, Reggie Saw. He was a wingman for a very long time, very experienced, knew what he was supposed to be doing. And he was very dependable. Lots of the guys, uh, there's lots of stories with he was there and did the right thing at the right time. Um, the other thing that some of the flight commanders did, and if you take the case of uh, von Richthofen, he famously used to use his men as decoys. So he'd fly them a few thousand feet below him to get attacked so he could then swoop in and claim all the victory. Um, not really the best thing if your squadron commander or your staffel commander is uh, doing that for you, uh, I might add. Um, right, so we'll now go on to 
a, a couple of examples of dogfights and give you an idea of the sort of thing they were doing. This picture depicts the 11th of August 1917. It was an evening patrol, they took off at about 7ish and around about 8pm Flight Commander Booker is leading a patrol of four aircraft. Jenna Parsons, one of his wingmen, experienced wingman, sees another aircraft and detaches to go and engage it. Jenna Parsons then has a bit of engine trouble and limps home to base on his own. So we're now down with three triplanes. They chance upon a dogfight of six Newports, six SE-5As and ten Albatross. Booker decides to target a black aircraft, usually signifying the leader, and in this case it's the CO of Yasta 12, Hauptmann Adolf von Tuchczek. There he is. He's already claimed 22 kills. Von Tuchczek gun has jammed just as he's engaging an SE-5. Booker attacks head on and uh, his radiator ruptures. Now in the case of their aircraft, that meant hot steams going around it was very close to their faces. So it looks very much like he's been hit and he's on fire. Von Tuchczek was hit in the shoulder and Tracer peppered his aircraft. He went into a spin. Booker follows him. Now when they went into a spin, they usually, if they were going down, they would turn the engine off. And it's quite an important factor and it comes out a couple of times in the other examples. Booker then, at this stage, goes after him, but he's then attacked by his wingman, von Tuchstedt wingman, Lieutenant Schobinger. And his petrol tank is hit, but he didn't know that because he's turned his engine off. Von Tuchstedt recovers at 1,500 feet when he recovered consciousness. His shoulder's damaged, he can't fly with his left hand, he turns on his engine and he just limps home at low level as quickly as he possibly can. Reggie Saw, who's Booker's wingman, at this stage is attacking von Tuchstedt's wingmen and he drives one off and the other one makes a fight. Interesting point here that Saw claimed a kill on the German but there were no Germans killed in this uh, dogfight and it gives an idea of the overinflated kill claims that people made. Right, so at this stage Booker thinks, right, I'll turn my engine on and get going. Um, and nothing happens, so he has to crash land in no man's land. He then gets out of the aeroplane, thinks, oh, thank goodness for that, sweat, climbs out, and the German artillery starts shelling him. So he has to sit in no man's land until the dark and then crawls back to his own trenches. The Naval 8 recovery team went to get the aeroplane that night and pick him up as well, uh, by which stage it had been destroyed by the artillery. And I think that just gives you an idea of what can happen. You know, you're talking about 20-odd aeroplanes all fighting along with each other. People, it must be impossible to figure out what's going on and who's doing what to who. Um, and, and that just gives a, a good indication. Booker, incidentally, uh, was killed a year and two days later by that self-same squadron. Um, I'll now talk about... Um, one, one guy I'm particularly fond of, uh, Flight Commander Little. And this is his Sopwith triplane, it's actual one, it's at the RAF Museum, and they found it at Boscombe Down, and the apprentices at uh, RAF Holton in the 1980s went to see if they could renovate this thing, and they found out when they saw the serial number that it belonged to Little. So the RAF Museum has now got his aeroplane there. And little on the 28th of December 1916. I closed in on one scout and we came at each other head on. I saw one of my tracers hit and stop the nose piece of the machine. I also saw a tracer from the enemy machine pass between my struts. We were so close that I dived to avoid collision and at the same time the hostile aircraft dived. We passed each other by three feet. Gives you an idea. You know, it's not like World War II where you were sitting miles away. Flight Commander Little, 28th, uh, sorry, 24th of April 1917, combat report. I met a hostile aircraft over our shell and dived to attack it. He turned north and I followed him, firing whenever the opportunity arose. I noticed the observer was not refer returning fire, so I closed in on him. He was losing height all the time. 
I observed my tracers going into his fuselage. I was firing at a range of 10 to 15 yards. He nosedived. I followed him. He landed in a field. I couldn't get my engine to go after the dive. So again, he's turned his engine off there. I landed beside the hostile aircraft and ran into a ditch and turned over. Little crawls out of his aeroplane to claim his prisoner, and the German pilot walked up to him, saluted smartly and said in English, it seems that I brought you down, not you me, doesn't it? And uh, they went off to a nearby mess, and this guy, Lieutenant Neumuller, wrote to uh, Little's wife, Mrs. Little, every year at Christmas, except in the Second World War. So there's that little bit of camaraderie between them. Um, the observer, Lieutenant Huppertz, was tangled up in the ammunition belts, which was the reason why they, uh, he wasn't firing, and it took him some time to uh, unravel him. And at the end of this, Little joked, he'd crashed so many aeroplanes, uh, almost as many as he'd shot down, so he had to keep on. Little, a little bit less chivalrous in this case, 26th of June, 1917. I attacked a hostile aircraft head-on from a little below. I then did a roll which brought me out 20 yards behind and going in the same direction as the enemy aircraft. I fired a burst of about 20 rounds and the AEA stalled and fell over on its back and did a flat spin. The enemy aircraft then caught fire and one man jumped out. Later, I saw another man crawling along the fuselage trying to get to the bottom. The machine was still upside down. So I fired at him and he fell off. Saw added, he came down, arms swinging and screaming his head off. I can still see Little's grin as he landed. So you go from the gentlemanly bit to the absolutely savage. Uh, the pilot was a Lance Corporal, he was 26. The observer would have been 29 two days later. Um, we now go on to combat missions, the, the types of mission that they did. Flight Commander Comston talks about the ground attack missions. Obviously not a big fan. Towards the end of the war, scout aeroplanes were used for low-flying raids. This work was decidedly unpleasant, for the air was full of all manner of projectiles, and one became a target for anyone's fire. On these raids, we carried, in addition to about 2,000 rounds of ammunition, four 16-pound bombs, which we dropped on anything which looked as if it might be improved by the addition of our bombs. Personally, I was always relieved when I'd found a suitable resting place for my cargo because I didn't relish being hit by a bullet on the bombs and being given a free pass to the next world, providing my own cordite for the job. Um, so strafing was very, very prevalent right uh, towards the end. Uh, one thing that they did do as well quite regularly was balloon attacks. And they had people, there was one guy, Flight, Flight Commander Monday, who was a bit of a specialist at this. This gives an idea. The RFC communiques, which are very gung-ho and, uh, you know, somebody's attacked the nasty person uh, type thing. 29th of September, 1917. Flight Commander Monday, Naval 8 Squadron, left the ground at about 9.45 p.m. and proceeded to attack the German balloon shed. On finding the objective, he dived down to within 20 feet of the ground and fired 50 rounds which the shed burst into flames. Flight Commander Draper, when over Dwight, saw the shed burning furiously, so flew towards it and dived down, attacking the men who gathered round in order to extinguish the flames. There's little doubt that the shed contained a balloon. 20 feet at night, firing into a balloon shed. You wouldn't get away with it nowadays. Um, I'll now talk about the pilot living uh, environment. Here's another picture of uh, Vert Galland. Um, as I've said, the squadrons operated as, um, as autonomous units. They, they basically had their own mess, and unlike the infantry, they had a comfortable bed and sort of batting staff to make sure they got up in the morning. They got a meal every day as well, so they, they were quite well off. But they were propelled into absolute hell with about 10 minutes notice each day that they flew. So it wasn't a cushy life, you know, it's not the cushy in the Women's Auxiliary Balloon Corps. It, it, it was quite a hard um, thing that they had to work on. Just out of interest, 
exactly the same thing happened in the Gulf War where they were staying in five-star hotels and then going out over Iraq and taking bridges out a few uh, hours later. Um, so the, the, the pilot living environment, the mess and social life, it was a club. Most of these people were public school. They saw it as a bit of a game and a very serious one, uh, but often a bit like sport. And hence the, you know, people going west and uh, the, the talk that they used. And Squadron Commander Draper talks about a flight sub-lieutenant, Walworth. When I was at home at Christmas 1917, dining in the Adelphi, Liverpool, I met Walworth. His father asked me to get him onto my squadron. His mother said he was an only child and should be happier if he was with someone they knew. It was very easy to arrange, which I think is quite a surprise. The boy, who looked 16, arrived for duty. I've never met anyone so keen, so bubbling over with enthusiasm. His letters home were a fine example of British spirit. Now bear in mind that Draper, as squadron commander, would have censored all the letters of his pilots. Once he wrote to a school friend, I've just landed back with holes in my petrol tank, but you simply don't know or feel the danger. It's just one big thrill. Hurry up and come out, it's wonderful. He only lasted a couple of months um, when he was shot down in flames on our side of the lines. In my letter to his parents, I particularly avoided any reference to the way he met his death. It was therefore more than distressing for them when a tactless infantry officer who'd reached the wreckage first took Walworth's charred cigarette case and pocketbook and sent them direct to his father. Um, Walworth is actually buried very close to Mont saint airfield, although he was shot down about 10 miles away. And mostly the, the, the people, any casualties, were taken to a casualty clearance station and buried right on the site. So Draper obviously did quite a lot of work to get Walworth's body over to the squadron. In addition, he made sure that the whole squadron were there for the funeral, which again shows a, a, a great deal of camaraderie. Um, while I talk about the squadron spirit, we've got a, a, a combat report which I found in the RAF Museum in an official... Um, it, it was supposed to be combat reports, and this, this was something to do with the flying ones. But this is from a, a flight commander, Jordan, about a raid on the mess on the 29th of November, 1917. Last night, a successful raid was carried out by Naval 8 Squadron. The raid, which had for, for its object a reprisal for various unfavourable activities of the enemy, accomplished everything that could have been desired. The attack was interesting from several points of view. It was carried out by pilots acting as infantry. It relied entirely on the element of surprise and counted on the enemy being slightly stupefied after his usual evening carouse. The attacking party, led personally by the Chief of Imperial Air Service, attired in new service uniform, crept up to the enemy's dugout and a signal had been arranged, viz. that one's very light should be fired. Through a mistake, however, 345 very lights were fired. This mistake was fortunately turned out to our advantage as the noise and light cowed the enemy and entirely destroyed his morale. Our attackers burst into his defences and very soon, it, it, uh, very soon overcame what little resistance was encountered. It appears our men entered an officer's mess and its occupants were, for the most part, lying around in attitudes of fatigue or drunken sleep. Specimens were examined and found to belong to the 46th Squadron Royal Flying Corps. They appeared to be men of poor physique, and for this reason it was not considered advisable to burden ourselves with any prisoners. It's considered that the enemy has been taught a very severe lesson. The king has conferred the third order of the angry bird upon the sea and sea. Only one of our men is missing. It's believed that he was overcome by hot air and poisonous gases. It gives you an idea of the spirit of the guys doing a, a, a raid on one of the other squadrons. Um, I talk about a character here, Reggie Johns, who was uh, one of the, uh, the big characters on the squadron, a lieutenant. Um, he regularly used to dress up as a gypsy and do fortune-telling sessions in the mess. Um, he was caught by a Canadian general climbing the chimney of the Canadian stove and broke it, fell off, and well, it hurt himself a little bit. Um, he once set off for a fire extinguisher at some guy who he thought was a lieutenant, but turned out to be a senior colonel in the American Air Force. 
Um, and he was very much life and soul of the party uh, with, with the squadron. He went for an air test at 2010 on the 11th of June, 18, and his aircraft uh, went into a spin and he crashed. Um, he was given a full mu military funeral, and again, Draper got everybody from the squadron to the funeral. On his headstone in this French communal cemetery, it says, he was the life and soul of the squadron, squadron, leader, squadron commander Draper. That's on his headstone. It's quite remarkable. Um, we go on to food. As I've said, um, they could get out every so often, and Flight Lieutenant Saw quotes Flight Commander Little on mess life and attitude. The pilots would often drive to Amiens for dinner at the Godbert. If stuck behind a car of French staff officers who wouldn't give way, Little would pull out his revolver and shoot a hole in the tyre of their vehicle. He never missed. Not condoned nowadays, I don't think. Um, to give you an idea of the attitude of these uh, people, I'm sure some of you will have seen this, The Young Aviator Lay Dying, a very popular song at the time, which just gives you a, an idea of the irreverent attitude that the guys had to what was going on all around them. In fact, I think they sing this in the film Aces High, which apart from that is total rubbish. <laughs> Okay, if we just carry on, alcohol. Nowadays, nothing would go on. They've got very different views, especially as what aircrew are like nowadays in the, in the modern Royal Air Force. Um, Flight Sub-Lieutenant Crundle, talking about drinking. Saw told me he had some friends on 16 Squadron RFC and Squadron Commander Brev Bromit gave us permission to visit. Saw's pals were very pleased to see him and produced quantities of whiskey. I don't like the stuff, and when I tried to refuse, I thought they were inclined to look upon me as a poor type, so I had a drink with them. We were at Bray for about an hour, and on the way back, I felt rather muzzy, but I landed quite well. <laughs> uh, a mess life, uh, again, Crundle talking about a party. In the evening, it was decided we needed something to drink, and a supply of champagne was obtained. The piano was played, songs were sung, and it developed into a merry evening. Quite a number had rather too much to drink, and it affected them in various ways. Jenna Parsons had crouched in the corner of the room. Suddenly, a wild expression came into his eyes as he saw Thornley sitting on a window ledge, peacefully smoking his pipe. He jumped into the air, dashed across the room, and buttered Thornley through the open window. Thornley did a backward somersault. After that, the party got a little rough, <laughs> uh, and one after the other were thrown into the swimming pool. Um, the next day... Flight Commander Little claimed a kill on the Dawn Patrol, and there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that Little would have been at that party. Not in my mind. It wasn't just the Allies. If you, uh, Crundle talks about a story he heard about a German senior officer. Flight Commander Gerard told me the tale of a Hun who crashed nearby a few nights ago. They heard a German machine flying very low. Suddenly they heard it crash through a hedge. When they arrived in the scene, they found a German pilot drunk and roaring with laughter. The passenger was asleep. Next day, they were astounded to find themselves prisoners. It seems there'd been a drinking party and the passenger, a fairly senior officer, had slid under the table. He was carried to the machine and taken for an airing by the junior pilot. The passenger was most annoyed when he found out what had happened. Uh, they had actually got a lot of time for pastimes and hobbies, and there are quite a few photographs, unfortunately I can't get one, of them building boats and floating them and uh, doing all sorts of things. Um, Little especially, I believe one of his boats is uh, in the Australian Air Force Museum in Melbourne. Um, and on Naval 8, they, uh, they used to build quite a lot of things, but they also built a swimming pool for themselves. And there's a, a picture of these fine figures of men all standing around the, uh, the squadron swimming pool. Right, I'll now go on to just talk about a couple of the characters, we've already heard about a few, um, that they had on the squadron. Flight Commander McKenzie, he effectively was the squadron tactic tactician early on. He only got one victory, he was shot down and uh, buried with military honours in a French civilian. And... Squadron Commander Bromit says this about him. I find it quite impossible to express adequately my admiration for this splendid officer. In the air, a fine pilot and brainy, courageous leader who inspired immediate and lasting confidence. His loss is irreparable. 
We go on to Flight Lieutenant Todd. Um, interesting thing about him, he was Canadian. He was, he was also reasonably old, relatively. But Canadians were offered a flying course uh, for $50. If they passed the course, they were given $100 back and they were given a commission into the Royal Flying Corps or RNAS. They were then shipped over to the UK to finish off their, their training. Generally, on the, the boat back over to the UK as well, they were poached by the other service. So quite regularly, somebody go in there as RFC and come out RNAS. Um, and we've got another Canadian pilot who talks about his arrival in London. A doctor caused great anguish with a no-nonsense and often scary lecture on venereal disease. Several jaws dropped when he described in graphic detail the dreadful happenings of a sexual nature that had been suffered by many earlier Canadians. At one point, he remarked, one complete ward at Chatham Naval Hospital was filled with over-amorous Canucks. Um, if you actually look at it, confidential reports, which I've seen of just about all the pilots, there were three members of Naval L8 who fell the, this sort of way. Not surprisingly, really, you know, if you've got a young guy who's 18, wonders what life's all about, knows he's going to get killed, possibly, uh, you can see he might want to sort of veer that way. Um, so, we, we talk more about Todd here. He was 30, and he was killed on the 4th of January. He was the 16th victim of Manfred von Richthofen. Von Richthofen said about this, it's obvious that the aircraft was superior to mine and that it was only the inexperience of the pilot which let me get into a position to kill. So it, this was a new aircraft on the, the front there uh, at that stage, the, the, the triplane. Now, von Richthofen actually visited the crash site to claim part of Todd's aircraft as a souvenir and we can see that there. So he's got his man cave with all the aircraft is shot down. A little bit cruel, I think. Now, one thing about Todd is that he has no known grave. He's commemorated the RNAS memorial. Now, there are two explanations for this. Manfred von Richthofen didn't give us stuff, just got his uh, trophy and, and left. Or Todd's grave was overrun, which I would like to think more likely, in 1917-18, uh, and his grave was lost but you can make your own decision on that, really. But von Richthofen shows himself there as a bit of a psychopath trying to get these little trophies of the people that he's ended their lives. We go on to one of my particular favorites because I can appreciate what this guy was like. Naval 8th for just over a month. He arrived on the squadron 43 hours flying. His total flying time, 59 hours, 16 hours on the squadron, and his death was confirmed on a German publication. Now, this was basically a note dropped by the Germans on the airfield in a weighted bag. There are quite a few cases, um, anecdotally, of these sort of things. I, had, I do actually have a copy of a 16 Squadron 1, exactly the same thing, where it's signed by both crew who'd been taken prisoner of war, saying they'd been treated well, one's injured, um, and it did used to happen a lot. So the Germans would have come back with this guy saying, we've buried him and um, he, he's sadly no longer with us. Now, um, in this particular case, Mrs. Smith, his mum, was completely, it was her only son, and she was distraught by it. So she wrote to Baron von Richthofen, care of the German Red Cross. And nine months later, she got this letter back, which is translated by the Foreign Office for her. And it does actually give details of his resting place, that he was buried with full military honours, and they sent her two photographs of the grave. So at least did something. Now, if you take Harold Smith, he's arrived on a squadron, He's flying in formations. He's got 43 hours experience. He wouldn't have had a clue what was going on most of the time. 16 hours later, when he's flying possibly on his own, he gets engaged, probably didn't even know anything about it, and falls to his death. Now, his, his mother was allowed to put an inscription on his uh, headstone, 
and his inscription, I think, is particularly impressive. High in the clouds he fought, nobly striving, he nobly fell, alone he died, for God, for right, for liberty. And I would say, Harold Smith, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I can tell his story. We'll now go on to some of the flight commanders. Flight Commander Price, DSC and Bar, on the squadron for three months, 12 victories. Killed in action, 18th February, 1918, the same day as Walworth, different uh, mission. So the squadron lost two people on that day. I'll go into Flight Commander Price's service record. Bit difficult to decipher there, but you might see that he was court-martialed in the Navy for giving his ship's position away while he was serving on board in a private letter. At that stage, he was obviously a bit of a pariah. No ship would have probably taken him on. That was the RNAS's gain because he turned out to be a remarkably good pilot. But and <laughs> it, it's amazing that this guy, you know, it suddenly becomes uh, on the, the ship. Uh, they don't want anything to do with him. I'll give you a quote from Flight Commander Compton. Determination, pluck and the power to lead were the attributes of Price. Irish and impetuous. He gave much trouble to the enemy, for he never gave in. I'll just use this bit here. That's the sop with camel gun sight. Scorning the oldest telescopic sight for his guns, he would put his head over the side of the machine and watch his tracer bullets riddling the enemy. This gave him no small amount of satisfaction, and I could see the sparkle in his eyes as he said to me one day, sure, I drilled him like a colander till the bur blighter burst into flames. We've already talked a little bit about Compston. Uh, DSO, DSC, two bars and a DFC. Uh, he was on the squadron for um, a year and a bit. 25 victories, never lost a wingman. So that is quite impressive. He, he, he didn't just hang around. Um, he was posted to Command 40 Squadron uh, from August 1918. He was relieved in February 18 for arrest. He served in the World War II and he got another DFC. So that was his third. Um, and he died in 1962. So quite a, a, a long and distinguished career. It would have been really nice to have met someone like that, I must admit. We've got Flight Commander Jordan, who did the trench raid against the uh, 46 Squadron. He was the Naval 8 highest scoring ace whilst on the squadron. He served them for just over a year, 39 victories, and he was rested in August 1918. And he was basically a physical wreck at that stage. Um, he survived the war, and he was killed in a car crash in 1930s. The one thing about um, Jordan was that he effectively took command of the squadron discipline-wise because Draper was so hopeless at, at that. Um, and looking at Draper's personal confidential files, there are some uh, points on there. An adverse report from Squadron Commander Breeze. I cannot recommend him for any position of responsibility, but would be much obliged if he could be removed to another command. Later, very little idea of discipline, but a brilliant pilot. And then another one from somebody else. Good command when he cares to exercise it, but he's too inclined to be boisterous. So you, you see that, I don't know exactly how Draper ended up as a squadron commander. Um, he must have had connections in some way or other. Flight Commander Little. He's the top scoring Australian ace. He's got his own room in the Royal Australian Air Force uh, Museum in uh, Melbourne. Um, and he, he was a remarkable man. Um, it wasn't all plain sailing though because being an Australian, he was quite belligerent, and he wasn't initially what was expected of a naval officer. So I go to his confidential reports, and here we go. As an officer, he is quite hopeless and likely to remain so, somewhat lacking in skill as a pilot. Uh, a couple of weeks later, this officer has been reported on unfavorably. If a further adverse report is received, his commission will be terminated. A month later, He's conducted himself satisfactorily. A few days later, very keen pilot. 2nd of March, nine months later. Specially recommended for promotion. 
1st of April, good ability to command, exceptionally brilliant fighting pilot. So it's a good job they didn't sack him because he did remarkably well. Um, pure speculation, entire speculation. And in the, there is a book called Unknown Warrior about him, written by an Australian guy who obviously doesn't want to besmirch his character in any way at all. But he married in September 1916, and his triplane was named after his son, Blimp, in March 1917. So if you go back to those days, there's only seven months between that, and his name in the aircraft after his son, my summation is that he, he, did get, he got married to Vera, but there was a little bit of scandal, and that would have not gone down well with the, uh, the Navy at the time. So my assumption is that it's something to do with that. There is absolutely no mention of that in the book. And I wouldn't like to besmirch the man's character because he was a remarkable chap. He was basically killed in action when he was on Naval 3 Squadron on the 22nd of May 18. Now, when he left Naval 8, he was a very, very shrewd fighter. He knew when to leave the fight, he knew when to get into a fight, and he did remarkably well. By all accounts, once he got onto Naval 3, or 203, he became a little bit too reckless. And basically, one night, on the night of the 22nd of May, he, uh, the airfield got a raid by a German Gotha. He got infuriated by it, jumped into his aeroplane and climbed up, not dressed in civilian clothes, out to go and shoot the thing down. Um, and basically, nobody really knows, but the Gotha gunners were more than likely fired back at his tracer when he was testing his guns out and got very, very lucky because he was hit in the leg and severed an archery. He landed the aircraft and was sat in it and he died drained from the blood. Um, he was, the next morning, he was actually identified by Flight Commander Booker, or he was a squadron commander at that stage, but one of his co-flight commanders on Naval 8 was asked to go and have a look at an aeroplane with a man in it. And he identified it as his old friend Little. Um, and it's really tragic, you know, stupid thing to go and do. But also, it looks like he landed intact and then just died uh, from bleeding. Um, he's buried in a place called Wavan's Cemetery. Uh, it's very, very small. It was a casualty clearing station. And there are only 50 graves in this place, but right next to him is McCudden. So you've got two of the best fighter pilots in the First World War, and they're buried in this tiny grave, just 50 graves in there. And I'm very pleased to say that in, um, in, in 2018, the Australian Air Force had a special presentation at the cemetery for Little, and members of Naval 8 and 208 Association went to that, which is really nice to know. Um, as a postscript as, as well, in 2013 in Queensland, a farmer found a Gladstone bag in a, a barn. He was going to throw it away and he had a quick look at it and it said R.A. Little. And he gave it to the police. The police did the right thing and handed it to the right sort of people. And they found goggles and a helmet and other flying equipment in it. And it was Little's thing. When they got it to Melbourne, the front flap in the helmet had a bump in it. And when they opened it up and took it all out, and very carefully, they found there was a photograph of a baby in it, inscribed with love Vera, and it was folded around an 1884 gold sovereign. So that was his lucky charm in there. Okay, and he was 22 years and nine months old. Packed in quite a lot in that time. Okay, we now go on to Booker, who just said he was the one that discovered him. Um, 29 victories, or total, but 23 on Naval 8. He joined Naval 8 as a flight sub-lieutenant, so he was a, the lowest of the low. Crundle talks about Booker. He's an Australian by birth who now lives in Tunbridge Wells. He says he hopes the war will go on forever because he loves air fighting, and if the war were to end, he's afraid he might not be able to find a suitable job. 
is a little fellow, usually very silent, who fears nothing, but he would run a mile from any girls because he feels so shy in their company. Comston talks about Booker. My mind turns to Booker, a man who said remarkably little but who did much. He was a tiger for air fighting, nor was his spirit directed only against the enemy, for he fought for his own men to get what he wanted for them. Jealously he guarded the rights of his men, fiercely he preserved the life of his pilots, and bravely he attacked the enemy, until one day the odds were too numerous, even for his skill and spirit. I did actually mention earlier, he was killed on the 13th of August 1918, and Crundle talks about the death of Booker. News has just been received that Major Booker, he's now a squadron commander and in the RAF, was shot down and killed. It was his practice to lead each new pilot on their first active service flights. Now, by this time, uh, squadron commanders were not really wanted or expected to fly on combat missions because of the loss on morale if they were, they were shot down. But he used to relieve the flight commanders of the training uh, issue by taking wingmen on their first sortie to show them the lines. On this occasion, a new pilot was following his lead and due to inexperience, couldn't keep in, the, couldn't keep in formation and strayed across the lines, where about 12 Huns pounced upon them. Booker fought a rear guard action and the new pilot got safely back to the aerodrome. Booker put up a tremendous fight and shot down two of the German machines, but was wounded. He crashed when landing, receiving severe injuries, and he died, he died in hospital. He was officially then credited with three aircraft in the fight because it had been witnessed by another patrol. He was the bravest man I ever met. He can't have been far short of meriting a Victoria Cross. He was 21 years and three months old. Now, my view on this as well, as the squadron commander, he wouldn't have had anybody that could write a citation for a Victoria Cross which may well be the, the, the thinking behind that. But again, a remarkable guy, 21. Okay, and now talk about some statistics then, a summary. They shot 11 aircraft down in flames, the 67 of them crashed and 195 were out of control. There was a total of 273 kills out of a total of 565 combats. The squadron operated in France for two years. 298 claims for kills. 26 pilots became aces. 28 were killed, 23 in action, five accidentally. So again, a thing you don't really think too much about, but there was a one in five chance that you could get killed accidentally rather than in action at that stage. Ten of the pilots have no known grave. Eleven became prisoners of war. Sixteen were injured whilst on the squadron. Now, if you take, there were 18 pilots on a squadron, there were 65 casualties in two years, and that doesn't include the people that didn't make it to actually for, uh, to serve on the squadron, finishing their training as such. Um, there were people withdrawn because of neurasthenia and problems with their lungs as well. Um, and so when you consider the turnover is three and a half times the personnel. And Naval 8, their, their casualties were incredibly low, especially if you take in comparison with an army cooperation squadron. And I'll now just have a quote from the squadron armament officer. I cannot adequately depict the cheerfulness, efficiency, unselfish bravery and wonderful comradeship of number eight naval. There was never anything like number eight naval and there can never be anything quite like it again. I hear its soul goes marching on as number 208 squadron RAF. All good luck to it. Okay, and there is a list of the roll of honour uh, of the people. Thank you for your uh, attention.
the office.